revive meetings that they've been having. Uh, tonight, there will be no service tonight here, no prayer meeting tonight. And if you will, remember the uh, hot dog fundraiser meal today, the youth are doing, uh, Children Action and Youth are also doing for the summer camps going on this summer. I think they're very close to reaching their goal and uh, maybe this will put them over the top. But uh, we ask you to, to support that as, as best you can. And also I'd like to uh, welcome our uh, guest speaker today, Larry McCoy. He is our associational uh, representative uh, from uh, Briar Creek and Elkhead Valley Association. And uh, uh, thank you, Larry, for coming to speak today and uh, pray for Pastor Dylan and Michaela as they're uh, traveling and get them some much needed rest and time together that they're, they're doing. And, uh, and Larry, when you, uh, at the, in a few moments, you will come up and, uh, and close the service as, uh, as you see fit and the Lord leads. And if you will, join me in prayer and I'll uh, lift us up. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for just being here in this church and being here to just hear our prayer to hear our, our cries to you for guidance and, and mercy when we need it. Father, we lift up this association, this, uh, this church, this congregation. I ask your Holy Spirit to move freely about this place this morning, Lord, to, to meet the needs that we have and to get us on the right path that we might, might have strayed from, to hear a, a kind word or a, maybe even convict our hearts of wrong that we might be doing that might be allowing us to stray. Father, we just ask you to, to, to draw us back into you and back into your presence. And Father, there might be somebody here that might not know you today, might not know who you are as Lord and Jesus and Savior. And I just pray that today might be the day that they'll uh, turn to you and accept you. And Lord, just uh, be with us in this service and let us uh, look to you and hear that still small voice, Lord, when you speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. I'd also like to welcome the people who are watching on live stream this morning. We never know who they are, but we we'll hope we will be a blessing to you. Let's stand as we sing together, and I hope you have a bulletin, because our words this morning are on the back of the bulletin, or you may know these. It's open our eyes, Lord, and in Christ alone. Let's stand.
time? <laughs> How you doing? Good morning. This morning, if you have your Bible with you, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Hebrews. And um, we're going to be looking at one particular verse. Sometimes you can find a lot in one verse. And I hope we'll see that this morning as we see what the Lord has to say to us. I want us first of all to join our hearts in prayer before we come to this time of the message. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks because this is the day that you've made and you have said, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we have many things to rejoice about because of who you are and who Christ is and who the Holy Spirit is. Paul tells us in Ephesians, there are so many blessings that come from you. Blessings of being chosen by you before the foundation of the world. To be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ because of your grace that is so rich and abounds to us because of salvation we have in Christ through his blood and forgiveness of sins. And the Holy Spirit who has seals our salvation and the guarantee of our inheritance, the guarantee of our salvation. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for allowing us, Father, to have your word that we can read and, Father, the opportunities we have to pray. And Father, I come now this morning to ask you to take your word and use it to encourage believers. And Father, there be anybody here today who knows not Christ. We pray that you will use your word to move into their hearts and bring them to conviction, bring them to Christ today. But we pray that your word will go forth and accomplish today what you want it to do. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Anne Graham Lotz, the daughter of Ruth and Billy Graham, has written a book with the title, My Jesus is Everything. It's not a big book, it's just a very small book. Got a lot in it, I'm sure, by her writing it, especially what I'm going to share with you on page nine. She wrote this, just look at Jesus. Do you want to know what is on the mind of God? Then look at Jesus. Do you want to know the will of God? Then look at Jesus. Do you want to know what is on the heart of God? Then look at Jesus. Jesus is the exact revelation of what is on His mind, His heart, and what is the will of God. Now this morning, I have come to ask us together to look at Jesus, but also to consider Jesus. Now, as I worked on this message, and what I've realized is look and consider is basically the same thing. But the emphasis is going to be on consider Jesus. Hebrews Chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. The writer of Hebrews if you spend much time in it, you'll understand that it's really, it is a long letter. And uh, although there are 13 chapters, it is a letter. Now we have chapters, but when this was written, it was like a letter. 
And he's exhorting the Hebrew Christians to consider Jesus. Preparing this message, I discovered that all 13 chapters that are found here can really be an exhortation to consider what is written in this letter concerning Jesus. Because you start out with Jesus, you get over into the 13th chapter, you find Jesus. It's all through there. And this is what this writer is, in, is trying to get them to understand. It's important to consider Jesus. Now there's, there's much in this letter. A lot is condensed into this one verse. Chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to see this morning that it's going to consist of two, two essential through truths that will guide us in considering Jesus. How to do that, what that means, that word consider, and then consider Jesus. The first thing we're going to see is that if we're going to consider Jesus, we ought to fix our minds on Him. Fix our minds on Him. Now, some answers about how to do this are found right here in this text. This is not an intellectual thing. You just, well, you think about Jesus and that's it. That's not what this is talking about. He says to consider Jesus. Well, how are we going to fix our minds on Jesus? How is that done, biblically speaking? Well, I want you to think of it this way, and as this will help us open it up for us. You make this considering Jesus where you're holding him in your mind and letting him be in your thoughts. Now that's easier said than done. Got your Bibles open in Hebrews chapter 3. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. And let's see what this writer says. Something very similar to what we read here in chapter 3 verse 1. The writer says this, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 12. Wherefore, now that's the same word you find over there in the third chapter. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so doth easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and set down, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So here we find this word looking. And it simply means to turn the eyes away from other things and fix them on something else. Concentrating on Jesus. So how in the world can we fix our minds on Jesus? How do we actually look at Him? Spiritually speaking. How do we work this out in our daily lives? Sunday through Saturday. Every day of our lives, how do we work this out to mean something? How do we do it? Well, here we find one of the answers. He's painting here in this chapter 12 of the Christian life as being a race. We're running a race, running a race, trying to get to the goal line, which is, of course, going to be heaven. And while we're on this earth, that's the race we're in. But you see, he says, if we're going to run the race well, we got to lay aside every sin that so easily ensnares us. And we've all got some kind of sin or sins that easily ensnares us. That's a problem for us. He says, we've got to get rid of it. We've got to lay it aside. I've got a Bible study by... Henry Blackaby and his sons. He's got four sons. I don't know if you all know about experiencing God, but that's a tremendous study. And it, he was the one who developed this out of his experiences as a pastor, missionary, associational missionary up in Canada. And uh, they have this 
this Bible study and it's got some interesting things and it's got character studies, word studies. And it's very interesting how they, they bring all these things together with the scriptures and, and give some practical teachings out of this. And they got one character study that is um, uh, by a very um, interesting person. She's one of the um, one of the ladies who actually um, wrote hymns that we have in our hymn book. Her name is Frances Ridley Havergal. And I'm going to share with you a story about her that I hope will help us to see what this writer of Hebrews is saying. She, um, by age 20, and listen to this, by age 20, she had memorized all four Gospels. Can you imagine that? Age 20. But she's also memorized the epistles in the New Testament. All the letters in the New Testament. She had also memorized Revelation, all the 150 Psalms, and Isaiah, the prophet. Now that's quite a feat by age 20. At age 37, she had uh, reached a spiritual milestone. Despite all this piety and spiritual growth that had taken place in her life, she still longed for a very deeper walk with God. She just wasn't satisfied with her relationship with the Lord and walking with Him on a daily basis. And she, um, one day she was reading 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7. And it's interesting how in people's lives, one verse can actually make a difference in their lives. It can do something to help them. Just one verse. So here's what she was reading. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And what gripped her, struck her, meant so much to her was that word all that we just read in this verse. Cleanses us, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Didn't say part of the sin, two-thirds of it, 99% of it. Said no, cleanses us from all sin. It moved her to realize the verb cleanse indicated that it was a continual work of God in her life, cleansing her from all the sin in her life. She realized God had provided a means for her to have no obstacles in her relationship with the Heavenly Father. There was not going to be anything between them now because the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed her from all sin. And it was, it was a... It, it was not, nothing to impede her in her relationship and fellowship with God. That's what happened to her. And she went on to write other hymns. She wrote, she, yeah, she wrote like a river glorious, I gave my life for thee, take my life. But that one verse impacted her life. And this is what the writer of Hebrews, we got to get rid of these sins that ensnare us. And this is how she come to understand how to get rid of those sins that ensnared her. Because she knew the blood of Jesus Christ would cleanse her from all sin. So how can we fix our minds on Jesus? The first thing is, got to make sure we don't have any sin ensnaring us. We fix our minds on Jesus because there's a, um, there's a verse over in Luke chapter 24. You don't have to turn to it, but I'm going, I'm going to explain the story and the verse. It was after Jesus' resurrection and there had been a, um, the story is two men were walking toward Emmaus, which is just about, oh, seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking about all the things that had happened. 
and uh, talking about Jesus' crucifixion and about the resurrection. And as they were walking along talking, Jesus came up and drew near them and began walking with them. And what happened next was they didn't know this was Jesus because the scriptures tell us that their eyes were restrained. God must have been keeping them from understanding and seeing that it was Jesus who was walking with them. So here they were walking along and Jesus said, what have y'all been talking about? And so they began to explain about the things concerning Jesus, that, about the details that uh, he'd been crucified and they'd placed his, his body in a tomb. And there had been some women, and you all remember the story, the women had gone down there to, with those spices and things to anoint Jesus' body. And they got down there and the, and the door to the tomb was open and there were some angels in there and they said, what are you doing here? He's not here. Mark says there was one angel sitting, on, sitting there inside the tomb and said, what are you all doing here? He's not here. He's risen. And so they went telling this about the story about this, that they couldn't find Jesus' body. What happened with the angels? And um, they couldn't find Jesus' body anywhere. And here's what happened. Jesus began at Moses and all the prophets. Can you imagine that? You're walking down this road and Jesus starts with Moses and all the prophets and telling them what Moses and the prophets had said about him in the scriptures. So how can you fix your mind on Jesus? Right there that story tells us. You've got to read and study the Old Testament. Now by that I mean this. Because you see in all 39 books of the Old Testament from Genesis through Malachi you're going to find Jesus Christ in all of the Old Testament. And you see if you want to keep your mind on Him you've got to meet Him in the Scriptures. You've got to meet Him in the Scriptures. He's there in the Old Testament. He's there in the Old Testament. All 39 books. Open up your Bible, begin to read, and let Jesus meet you and you meet Him. Listen to Him because He's there. That's how you begin to fix your eyes on Him. That's how you begin to look at Him. How can we fix our eyes on Jesus, our minds on Jesus? Meet Him in the New Testament. I've been reading through the Gospel of Mark and um, on April the 21st, I was reading Mark chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. And Jesus <clears throat> was talking about listening. Listening. And here's a summary of what I wrote in my, in my journal. That's not the exact words, but I, I kind of went back and I'm, I'm trying to give you the summary of what I wrote down. It just, as I, as I was reading this, it just dawned on me what Jesus was trying to say. And here's what I have written. It is important to pay close attention to what Jesus is saying. Close attention. Why? Because Jesus said, when you listen closely to me when I'm speaking in the Scriptures, you will gain more understanding. When you do not listen closely to me, the little understanding you received, <laughs> it's going to be taken away. Folks, I'm telling you, that made an impact on my life about listening and listening closely. You see, this is how we can fix our eyes on Jesus is to get into the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Read that and let Jesus talk to us. Let Him speak to us. Because He will. But we got to listen. Listen closely. It's not just reading through something to get through it. You've got to pay attention to it. And I, um, 
Sometimes I use what's called the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible is made up of scriptures, but there's little parentheses and little markings along the way that give you the understanding of words. And I went back and I opened up that Amplified Bible, and this is what it said about listening. What Jesus is trying to say, he says, when I'm asking you to listen, I want you to listen with your mind. I want you to think about what I'm saying, and I want you to give some study to it. Think about what I've said. Listen to me as you read. Think about it and study what it means. You see, when you're doing that, you're meeting Jesus. You're listening to Him. Just like this beloved Christian music writer. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, He cleanses all my sin. I'm grateful to Herschel Hobbs. He was one of our, he's no doubt with the Lord now. He was a former pastor in Oklahoma in, in the Southern Baptist Convention. And he's got a book there called The Fundamentals of Our Faith. And I just want to quote what he, what he wrote about the Scriptures and Jesus. He said, The Bible itself becomes unintelligible apart from Jesus Christ. You can't understand it without Him. The Old Testament is a messianic hope, and Jesus is the Messiah. The Gospels recount his incarnation. You see, his coming to earth as a man. Acts tells us of his continuing work. The epistles interpret Christ's person and work. The revelation sets forth his victory and glory. Do you see? If you want to meet Jesus, you want to focus on Jesus, fix your mind on Jesus, you want to think about Jesus, start with the Old Testament, keep with the New Testament. That's where you're going to meet Him and that's where you're going, He's going to talk to you and that's where you can see Him and listen to Him. That's what this writer is saying. Consider Jesus. Pay attention to Him. Fix your mind on Him. And those are some very practical things about how anybody who believes in Christ and anybody who doesn't can learn about Him when they get to the Scriptures. Well, the second essential truth is there are blessings for the holy brethren. Let's go back over to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Now, let's look at this. He says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Now, holy brethren, this is what I want you to do. You who are partakers of the holy calling, I want you to consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That's what I want you to do. Well, let's look at this for a moment. One of the blessings as one of the holy brethren, now we say brethren, we say brothers and sisters in Christ too. We're not living out the women. Brethren is, you know, uh, when we were on the mission field, one of the things about the Hispanic brothers and sisters there, here's one of the ways they would greet you. They would say, Como esta hermano? How are you doing, brother? They use that word brother and sister a lot. To greet one another. And that's biblical. That's biblical. He says, you are the holy brethren. What does it mean to be holy? Well, in this context, in this chapter, verse 3 and verse 1, it means a holy brother or holy sister is sanctified. You see, we don't start out life as holy brethren and sisters. We start out as sinners. As sinners, we are unclean. We need somebody to restore our souls. We need somebody to cleanse us from all of our sin. We need somebody to do that for us. We're contaminated with sin as human beings. We're unclean. We come into this world that way. And no person, no individual is ever able to purify himself or herself from this sin in our lives. Therefore, we cannot have any access to God because of this. And this brings us to the question, what does it mean to be a holy brother and holy sister? Here's what it means in the book of Hebrews. It means sanctified, and that means that your sins have been purged. Purged. 
Let's go back to chapter 3, verse 1 for a moment. And listen. Here's what you see it is saying to us. Jesus Christ is the one, because of our faith in him, has purged us from our sins. Purged us. Um, Listen to this. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, listen to what the writer says about Jesus Christ. And there's a whole, you know, when this writer starts out, he's starting out with God the Father and Jesus Christ. And he gets down to verse 3 and he says, Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory, that is the brightness of God's glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. When he purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Messiah, excuse me, of the majesty on high. It is Jesus Christ who purges us from our sins. The word purifying us of our sins was done by Christ personally. You know, when you go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, here's what you find. Peter writes, Christ carried our sins in his body. I heard a, I know I'm being critical of somebody, but this is not right what I'm getting ready to tell you. I heard someone preaching on the radio one day and they said, Christ carried our sins on his body. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures say he carried our sins in his body. I can't imagine that. But that's what it says. Why did he do that? He said, so we can be dead to sin and live for what's right. And by his wounds we're healed. Now this is right out of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. By Jesus' wounds, you know, he was beaten. Those nails driven into his hands and into his feet. All those wounds. That's, he says, that's how you've been healed. That's how Jesus carried our sins in his body. He's, his wounds have healed us spiritually. And he goes on to say, well, he said, we've all been like sheep. We've wandered away. But now we have turned to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Shepherd and bishop, that's all about protection. That's all about taking care of us. You see, Jesus is the one who's purged our sins. And there's a, there's a wonderful verse in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Jesus Christ loved us, and listen to this, washed our sins in His blood. Think about that. He washed our sins in His blood. That's how we become holy brethren and sisters. When we put our faith in Christ, That's what's happened. We are the holy brothers and sisters means that we're separated from the world and we're dedicated to God to serve Him. You know, here's one of the things that I believe lay people, and I'm I'm talking about men and women who are not ordained to the ministry, to the gospel ministry, or ordained to serve in some capacity in a church or seminary or in some uh, convention level. They've been ordained. It doesn't make us any better than anybody else. It doesn't make us any better than anybody else. We're all on the same level. But you see, a lay person is not ordained. I want you to listen carefully to this. I think it'd be a great step in the right direction if the holy brethren, the holy brothers and sisters in Christ and in their churches were actually commissioned by their churches and to be sent back out into the world to serve the Lord with their spiritual gifts. Just like we ordain somebody to the gospel ministry. Why don't we commission the lay people to go back out? I remember we had an associational meeting in, in, um, in Briar Creek and 
we had a commissioning service one night at one of our associational meetings. Our team was going to, to Cuba. And, I, and I, we planned this so the team members would be out in the aisle and where the people could gather around them and pray for them as they went out. Now, why don't we do that in our local churches? Sent out to use your spiritual gifts. You know something? I, I, think, I, I think I'm saying this correctly. Bob Foy, who works with the Baptist State Convention and Church Renewal Journey, which is for lay people in the church. And I, I think I'm saying this right. If I'm apologize to him if I'm, if I'm not. But I think he said there's a, like 3% of the people in local churches even know what their spiritual gifts are. I think one of the greatest things could be happening in the church is that the lay people could be equipped as holy brethren to serve the Lord with their spiritual gifts, equipping them to do it. For example, you may have people teaching a Sunday school. They shouldn't be teaching a Sunday school. They don't have the gift of teaching. Some people have the gift of serving. You know, the Bible says there are even the, there's a spiritual gift of healing God has given to people in the church. People who have the gift of encouragement. You see, there are all kinds of spiritual gifts in there. But I believe we need to commission them. Send them out. And I'm talking about send them out into the everyday lives to use those spiritual gifts. We're partakers of a holy calling. Let me give you an example of how this happens. You remember Matthew was a tax collector, and um, he, was, he was despised because he worked for Rome. And what he did was he was a tax collector. And tax collectors had a bad reputation because they also collected extra money. And boy, the people didn't like that. He was like a, I mean, poison. You know, you don't even want to be around this guy. But one day he's sitting at the tax office and here comes Jesus and he passes by. And he says two words to Matthew. <laughs> he says, follow me. And this sorry tax collector, now I'm saying every tax collector is sorry. I'm just, he was sorry. People hated him. Do you know what he did? Jesus said, follow me. He got up and followed Jesus. That's all, that, that's all that happened. But you know, today, we know him as Matthew, one of the 12 apostles. Matthew, who wrote the <laughs> Gospel of Matthew, that sorry tax collector. Hated. Follow me. You see, God calls people to follow Christ. And this, see, this heavenly calling, this is what we're talking about. Some people come, God calls them through the preaching of the gospel. Some people come because somebody's witness to them. Some people come because somebody quoted Psalm 103. I mentioned about Henry Blackaby and his sons had a, uh, had a uh, Blackaby study Bible. There's a story in there about a man. Back, it was one of the wars. And I don't remember which one. I don't think it's World War I. I mean, World War II may have been one. Anyway, he was wounded to some degree, got hurt. And I think he was in the hospital and he started quoting Psalm 103. You all know what that's? Bless the Lord, O my soul. With all that's in me, bless his old name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all his benefits. He forgives all of our iniquities. He heals all of our diseases. He redeems us from destruction. <laughs> he, he crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies our mouth with good things so that all of our youth is new like they He was quoting Psalm 103. And because people heard him quoting Psalm 103, people were being saved. Can you all imagine that? Just by quoting Psalm 103. People are being called out by God to follow Christ. That's the heavenly calling. God calling people out. Oh boy, I see. And you see, we, we, 
we become partakers with other believers. That means we're partners. It means we're partners. That's what partakers means. We're partners. You all are holy brethren in this church, brothers and sisters. But you got that holy calling. God has called you and you're partners. You're partners. That's what it means. And then as holy brethren, we have a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ. You see, our confession in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 is simply this. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Profession is also actually means confession. So what the writer is saying, okay, holy brethren and sisters, confess Jesus Christ. He's an apostle. As far as I know, that's the only time he's called an apostle. An apostle, of course, is somebody who's been sent out to do something. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles to do something. He said, go preach, go heal the sick. And they went out and did that. But we need to understand Jesus Christ is an apostle. And John 3, 17 says it clearly why Jesus Christ was sent. He was sent into the world by God the Father... And this is what John 3, 17 says. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why he was sent. He didn't come to condemn anybody. He didn't come to condemn Matthew, that sorry tax collector, man who hated by his people. He didn't come to condemn that prostitute who came and Try to begin to wash his feet. Didn't do it. Just didn't do it. You will turn over chapter 4. Our confession also is Jesus Christ is our high priest. He's our apostle. He's our high priest. Boy, this was one that's loaded. Just like the other one. Chapter 4, verses 4, 14 through 16 reads this way. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now that's about his ascension. He passed through the heavens. Acts chapter 1. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of him. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. We all got our weaknesses. Some people don't know how to sympathize. Y'all know that, don't you? Some people do. But Jesus, He knows how to sympathize with our weaknesses. But was in all points, in all points, tempted as we are. In all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And what he's trying to tell to us, Jesus is the great high priest and he's going to help us in good time for every need appropriate and well-timed help. He's going to give us the help before it's too late. And think about that. He's going to give it to us before it's too late. Watchman Nee 
was a Chinese Christian. He's got a book called The Normal Christian Life. He tells us what the normal Christian life is. <laughs> he outlines it actually in one of the, I think it may be on page nine. He actually tells us on page nine what it is. And then he goes into all the depth of it. But he wrote, he, he, he wrote this sentence and, and I wrote it down on a card because I, um, I wanted to, I didn't want that to slip my mind. I didn't want to forget about it because it just, um, it just stood out. It jumped off of the page, so to speak. And uh, it says this, God makes it clear in his word that he has only one answer, one answer to every human need. And that answer is his son, Jesus Christ. Every human need you got, Jesus is the answer. Now that's a powerful statement, but it's biblical. It's biblical. I look out at this congregation this morning and I see your faces. But I can't see inside your heart. I can't do that. I can't do that. I do not know what your particular needs are this morning. I don't know. I know what mine are. But I don't know what yours are. And it's possible that you came here today with no particular need in your life this morning. You may have done that. You may think, well, everything's okay. And that's great if everything's okay. But maybe this morning in your Sunday school class or maybe something has been said in this message today has made you realize you got a need that Jesus Christ needs to take care of right now. Today. I don't know that. I can't see your heart. Maybe there's somebody here today that's never received Christ into life. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe so, maybe not. If you don't have Christ this morning, maybe suddenly this morning you realize you need Christ in your life. I don't know that. Because I can't see your soul. Jesus can, though. Maybe you've been thinking about coming to Christ. Yeah. You know, Jesus made it very, uh, Paul made it very simple about how to be saved. Not very complicated. It's Romans 10, 9 and 10. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now how simple can you get? Nothing complicated about that. You simply confess, believe. You're saved. So maybe you do know Christ, as I said. Maybe this morning you got some need that Jesus needs to take care of. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads and I'm going to lead us in prayer. And I'm simply going to ask if anyone wants to, needs to come to Christ today. As we pray, I just ask you to raise your hand that you, you're saying, I want to come to Christ today. And I want to pray for this congregation of brothers and sisters 
in Christ. So let's do that. I ask you to bow your heads so we can pray as a congregation. Now as you have your heads bowed and eyes closed, I just ask anyone that if there's a need to you to come to Christ today, just ask you to raise your hand. That's all it's very simple to do. Come to Christ today. Anybody? Father God, I come to you at this time to pray for these brothers and sisters, these holy brothers and sisters, these partners of a calling, these who servants in this church. Father, I pray for whatever needs there are in their lives. I pray that, Father, at this, at this time, they may be able to simply come and Jesus let you be the answer to whatever that need might be. Because you know their hearts. May not be an overwhelming need, but it's a need. And maybe it may be an overwhelming need, but it's a need. And Father, I just want to give few moments here for these brothers, holy brothers and sisters in Christ to talk with you. Talk with you, Jesus, and let you become the answer for their need this day. Father, this is their time. I give it to you.